we have an important issue to uh, address and uh, it will keep us awake because it's so critical. <clears throat> Before I just get into that, just to set the scene for what this is all about. I've come from Kenya, a country that, as you all know, has been completely flooded, overwhelmed by rains we've never seen before. The roads in Nairobi now, right now are completely impassable. So traffic jams and Nairobi, I think after Lagos in Africa, Nairobi is the second craziest place to try and drive, uh, but partly because we don't have too much uh, patience, I think. Uh, so those roads are completely, you know, in a, in a really bad way. The expressway that takes you these days in a matter of minutes from anywhere in the middle of Nairobi right up to Jomo Kenyatta International Airport, when it floods or when it was flooded, it too, you know, the cars could hardly uh, move. And we lost a lot of people, a lot of, uh, you know, people who do their business on motorbikes, we call them border borders, really had a rough time. So part of the reason we're here is to look for solutions to, you know, th this kind of issues. So in my panel today, I would like to invite my guests uh, on board. Uh, let me start with Juliet, if you can come on board. <clears throat> so Juliet uh, Kabera is the Director General of the Rwanda Environment Management Authority, or RIMA. Um, she plays the role of a regulator. She has lived this reality, and it's her responsibility to make sure that this country at least, you know, keeps safe in terms of environmental you know, challenges and, and damages. So thank you very much indeed. My next uh, guest has come all the way from Zimbabwe. Uh, come along please, Professor Innocent Chirisa. He's Vice Chancellor uh, of Zimbabwe Ezekiel Gutu uh, University. This is a man who sleeps and dreams about uh, urban development and planning, and he's got some very interesting thoughts to share. Also proud to say that this is a holder of two PhDs. I don't know how we get to the first one, but um, <laughs> Prof, you're very welcome. And then my third guest uh, this afternoon, Teddy Mugabo, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Rwanda Green Fund. Um, now she has that difficult job which a lot of countries in Africa are struggling with, which is climate finance. How do you finance the business of going clean or going green with your energy. That sits squarely at her docket, so she'll share her thoughts on experiences so far. Finally, least, uh, last but not least, uh, Professor Beth uh, Kaplan. She's a senior researcher at the Center for Excellence in Biodiversity and Natural Resource Management at the University of Rwanda. Again, she's got some interesting perspectives which we shall get into uh, in, in a moment. So that's my panel. Uh, apologies to two of our guests who should have been on, but for uh, understandable reasons, they could not make it onto this trip. So please, a warm welcome to the panelists. The brief for the panel is simple. This is a security symposium. Where do you locate climate change crisis within, uh, you know, within that security spectrum? And having you know, gone through all the challenges that we're facing, the things that we need to do, what are the solutions? And how, what do we need to do uh, in the meantime? So we've got a planner in the mix, we've got a regulator in the mix, you've got all the people that you'd want, and you've got uh, someone who looks after or tries to find the money to do all these kind of things. So that's how we'll do it, and then we'll, uh, we'll get into the general uh, discussion. I hope from here we can come away with some real practical solutions uh, that, you know, uh, we, we can live by. Uh, our MET department in Kenya says we're not done yet. It's been dry, it's been stable for the last few weeks, but they said you can expect anything between now and the month of, uh, of June. And just for the record, this is nowhere near. Our rainy season is usually in April, and January is the hottest period of the year in Kenya, not anymore. We started those small rains in January, and we're not out, you know, of the pit yet. So this will be a fascinating, and I must say, really critical uh, discussion for our colleagues and uh, students who are going to, the enemy now may not necessarily carry a grenade, they may not carry armed you know, aircraft, the enemy is right outside your door, as you'll hear from these uh, experiences. So let me, without wasting much time, I invite uh, Juliet to, you can choose to speak from here. 
My name is Juliet, as earlier introduced. It's an honor for me to join this discussion this afternoon. You know they say climate change is like an enemy that does not play by the rules. It never shows up on time, just like we saw in Kenya, and it doesn't follow a predictable strategy. But as army officers, we, I was going to say we, but <laughs> you are, you know a thing or two about adapting and overcoming. So let's talk about how we can build resilience against this unpredictable enemy uh, called climate change. One of the most pressing challenges, as uh, projected earlier, uh, that Africa is facing is climate change. As we explore its impacts, we must confront the security challenges climate change poses to our continent. We also have to appreciate its intricate effects on our social, political, and economic landscape, and discuss practical solutions for building resilience. First, let us examine the security concerns linked to climate change, the impacts on food, the impacts on water, and energy supply are profound. Increasing competition over decreasing natural resources. Climate-related disasters lead to forced migration and displacement. And all these threaten livelihoods and regional stability. In 2023 alone, Africa experienced 64 natural disasters, primarily under the sub-Saharan region resulting over 20,000 deaths and affecting 12.7 million people. In Rwanda, we remember that we lost 131 lives in May 3, 2023. Extreme weather events such as the devastating rains in Kenya that we've just seen in pictures highlight the urgent need for coordinated disaster response. Africa's vulnerability to climate change is intensified by its economic dependency on climate-sensitive activities and products, coupled with low adaptive capacity. Weak economies, and this is really hurting to mention, but weak economies, weak institutions, and governance structures hinder effective responses to these problems. According to the Africa Development Bank, Climate change is projected to reduce Africa's GDP by up to 2.25% by the year 2030. In Rwanda, climate change reduces our GDP by 1% per year. And the total cost of adapting to climate change is estimated to be $5.3 billion US dollars in the year 2030. The complexity of these impacts, climate change, is evident uh, in recent events. I want to cite a few in addition to Kenya. Um, in 2023, Johannesburg reported a year of climate massacre with over 15,700 lives lost to extreme weather and 34 million people affected. Heavy rains in Kenya. Uh, we just saw that they caused over 228 lives, displacing 190,000 people and damaging infrastructure. In the face of these challenges, we must discuss practical solutions. One critical approach is to enhance the role of the military in disaster response. Climate change worsens the frequency and severity of natural disasters, necessitating a coordinated and immediate response. Militaries can provide pre-positioned aid, such as water, food, and shelter, to ensure rapid assistance during emergencies. Legislative changes, obviously, might be required to enable such deployments, ensuring that military resources are swiftly mobilized when lives are at risk. Moreover, the military can play a crucial role in resilience building efforts. By focusing on climate change, on climate resilient farming and food production, we can enhance food security. Military medical resources 
should be utilized to treat climate-related diseases, such as vector-borne diseases and cholera during floods. The military can also explore reforestation to offset carbon emissions, not only for carbon market potentials, but also for increasing resilience. The military's credibility and extensive reach can, can make it an effective vehicle for raising awareness and communicating vital meteorological information to communities. Additionally, the military can employ the state-of-the-art technology to establish or support early warning and monitoring systems for disasters to improve readiness for extreme weather events. In conclusion, Africa stands at a critical juncture in the fight against climate change, but by leveraging practical solutions, partially through the military, we can build resilience and safeguard our continent's future. Together, we can turn the tide on climate change and secure a sustainable, prosperous Africa for generations to come. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much indeed. I've just got one question for you. How much time do we have to do the things that we need to do? We were supposed to do them yesterday. Don't, we don't have time. How do we? <laughs> so how do we catch up with that time? I think not all is lost. What we just went through is an eye-opener. We now see that it's real. First, we had to struggle with understanding what climate change was. And second, we used to think it's uh, an exaggerated problem. It's no longer an exaggerated problem. It's no longer uh, a question to be responded to by professors such as Beth. We are all seeing and living with the impacts of climate change. And without being a prophet of doom, it's only going to get worse. So we just need to build our adaptive capacity and make sure that we have everyone in this, uh, in this struggle. Otherwise, our very hard and economic development is going to be affected as we go on. Thank you. Are, are there some specific steps that you've taken at RIMA to help address this situation? Yes, so we started by understanding the problem, first of all. So we have done uh, projections. We need to understand how do we plan because it all starts with the planning. Uh, if you cannot plan for the right budget, the right resources to be in place, you cannot tackle the problem as it grows. So we started with, uh, with carrying out projections for the next 100 years to see how much precipitation are we going to get, how much rains, what, are, what is the intensity, and that we understand. And this is what informs the economic development strategies that we make. This is what informs uh, the, the short-term and long-term uh, strategies of the government. Uh, so then we can mobilize the resources and make sure that whatever we are putting across as development strategies are climate-proofed. Thank you. So, did I hear you right? Did you say a 100-year plan? Yeah. We're struggling with five Projection. and ten. <laughs> no, it's projections. <laughs> projections, yeah, that's right. Of climate data. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Professor Chirisa, please come and share your experiences from Southern Africa. Uh, if you want to speak from there, you're, you're more than welcome. Coming from, from Zimbabwe, uh, I'm an urban and regional planner by training, and I've had uh, uh, more than 18 years of experience in the classroom. And I would say one of the modules that I taught for quite some time is environmental planning or environmental systems and planning. And uh, what I've uh, seen as a shift was when we started uh, some 20 or so years ago, it was just aesthetic uh, teaching, like just it's a, it's a, a textbook issue. But uh, the dynamics now which we experience, it, uh, it means uh, the environment has been reawakened and what is the major trigger? It is uh, climate change. Uh, I will tell you, in 2019, in Zimbabwe, although we've experienced a number of cyclones, I think from 2000, Cyclone Eileen, uh, among other cyclones, the 2019 cyclone was uh, quite devastating. 
in that uh, the cyclone Idai, as it is uh, called, it uh, shook us because uh, the cyclone came through the Mozambican channel into Zimbabwe. We've always thought we were safe because we are landlocked. But uh, this time, it ended right into our territory. What did we notice after some more than 24 hours of intense rain? Well, we saw and we had huge boulders of rocks being moved, uh, infrastructure being uprooted. And uh, this was unheard of. We had never experienced such. Of course, there were, or there are so many other theories. Others could attribute it to spirituality, that maybe the gods are crazy. But uh, when we closely look at it, uh, it left some fears. Now that when there is even some clouds hanging over there, uh, communities that were af directly affected, uh, especially in the Manikaland province, which is eastern Zimbabwe, they, they, they freeze when they, 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 they change, the, climate, the weather changes. So what am I saying? What we used to think was something far distant, which could not affect us, is now become part of our life. And we have to, nothing but to prepare. Uh, then this year, or the 2023-2024 season, uh, in, uh, particularly in Southern Africa, we talk of South Africa, Namibia, uh, Malawi, Zambia, Zimbabwe. It has witnessed uh, a very dry uh, climatic uh, event, the El Nino effect. And uh, I will tell you, uh, the extreme weather events that are associated with climate change, they are wreaking havoc, and we are living with that reality. You, that's when you see a farmer having spent all the time preparing uh, to plant, uh, even to plow, invest in fertilizers, then the crop, everything is just lost. So it's a double loss, loss in the investment, and uh, eventually also loss. And what does this bring into our minds? Now, how are, we, are, are the people going to, to, to survive? Because they are also faced with, with the with famine, there are no jobs, and in the morning we heard about uh, the radicalization of the youth. Coming from uh, a university environment, I would say Zimbabwe alone, one, in one year, it uh, produces about 40,000 graduates who are going to be facing unemployment, now facing the other challenge of famine, no jobs. I think I've, we've just heard Juliet talking about, about how climate change also re has reduced, and they have seen the effect, reducing the GDP uh, of, 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 of the country. So that is the extent to which uh, climate change has become a, a serious uh, hazard and a risk at the same time, which we are experiencing at this moment. And, uh, it poses then as a security threat, a security issue, uh, the radicalization of the youth, which I heard in the morning. It's quite possible. Uh, we, we have even begun to experience uh, increased uh, safety challenges in various places, be it rural or urban areas. Uh, when people are not having the food, not having the jobs, uh, when they, they have to face life, it's a matter of, of livelihoods. And the question, and in literature which is coming out, do we need to look at the livelihoods, uh, sustainable livelihoods framework that was uh, uh, posed by people like Chambers in the early 90s? Does this still fit, or do we have to reframe, rephrase it, so that we, we, we speak to the new uh, realities? So. 
I would say uh, our countries really are in a serious and dire uh, state which, which, which calls for, for, for action. And maybe before I, 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 I hand over to you again, Joseph, in Zimbabwe, I, I, I wouldn't know, but uh, last year in November, the president made a, what he's call, calling a call for action. And uh, as a planner, if you come to Zimbabwe uh, this year, every planner is, is, is busy. We are, what are we doing in the 1992 local authorities that are in the country? We are doing master plans. And we believe that uh, with the master planning, which takes stock of every uh, uh, item in a, in a space, uh, we are going to, 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 to then come up with the proposals that would see uh, more resilient uh, settlements. Uh, but remember, this is planning. And after planning, one other thing which I've realized, planning alone is not enough. Resources have to be there, which makes it also a very serious budgetary issue. Uh, up until also governments have that will to, con to, to consider planning as a budgetary issue. Uh, maybe we'll be just also doing the talk show. A quick one. Uh how do you distinguish, you, you've made this, uh, alluded about the link between crime and climate change. How do you make that direct connection uh, uh, as opposed to, you know, an economic downturn, that the country has been on a slowdown? How can you directly attribute the rise in crime or physical harm to climate change? Well, uh I would say that cl climate, we need to see or the, the environment as a system. And a system which affects the natural and the, the human aspects of, or cultural aspects of, 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 of that system. Uh, when you look at it, uh, once there are shortages because we have experienced, say, drought. Or once someone is without uh, disposable income because also they don't have jobs, because I, I think it's a myriad of, of factors, but it's a complex, I, I would say. Uh, we, we talk of complexity, but one thing, there's that knock-on effect. Climate change then aggravates the extreme weather events, then aggravates certain shortages. I talked about the, the, the budget, for example. Uh, in, in, in the Sadak region, two days, three days ago, there was a summit just discussing the El Nino effect. And uh, why heads of government spend all that time now discussing this issue? Because it has a directly result of, 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 of any weather event triggered by climate change which exacerbates the, the already challenges that we have. Africa is Africa, we already have, we are already in a mess. And uh, then more fuel is added to the fire <laughs> because of climate change. And th th that's how you, you then see the, the, the impact becoming even more aggravated. Last one, I'll, I'll put you on the spot on this uh, a, a little bit. Um, we heard from Juliet about the importance of involving uh, for example, the military, who even in my own country, who are the only ones who have that capacity to come and sort out some of this mess that we're in. Is it viable in Zimbabwe to draw in the military? I'm sure the military people, they are disciplined. And, uh, well, maybe that, uh, that, that, that's my uh, supposition. Uh, however, I remember in my country some 10 years back, faced with so many of these droughts, there was a deliberate uh, attempt by government to organize what was called Operation Maguta, Kuguta in Shona is uh, satisfied from hunger. Yeah. And a lot of funding was induced in that. 
And uh, supposedly, it was the military who were supposed to. But I think somewhere, some, somewhere things didn't <laughs> work out too well, because I think uh, the military may be given the responsibility, the mandate, but also do we have uh, the political will to sustain uh, that mandate. So it was a, an experiment to me that failed because uh, the disciplined people, maybe they were not given really time and space to be on the ground to really effect the change because it was supposed to fund some irrigation, uh, get some equipment, uh, in, in invest in all sorts of, of, but I think there's this capture which happens. And I, uh, someone in the morning mentioned about uh, corruption. Uh, was it the Major General? Uh, we, there, there are times when we become also our own enemies. Uh, resources are availed, but someone, I think the worst problem is when someone wants to eat the seed and rather not the fruit. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, quite interesting. Now, uh, I'm going to turn to you, and I must say, in my other life, I am, a, I am a trainer of editors and African journalists when it comes to climate change, and as part of that, I've had the privilege of interviewing a number of African presidents from Kenya, Comoros, and Malawi, and they all cry about the same thing. Listen, we hardly ever pollute, you know, it's, it's, it's hardly above 4%, it's below that. We make, you know, we, we produce the least emissions but we are worst uh, hit. And when they come to share that, that beautiful cake, with, I don't know whether it's velvet or whatever it's made of, <laughs> between the countries, Africa gets a pretty raw deal. Now you're in the money business. I hope that's something that you can, you, you, you can those concerns you can address. Please, welcome. Thank you. Uh, so maybe I dive directly into the money, <laughs> just to you know, give it some background. Uh, it is true that uh, when you look at the issues of climate change, yes, you do have the contributors, so the, the, the developed countries that have, due to the industrialization uh, phase, they, you know, they had to, basically it was the economies that were based on fossil fuels, so that's, that resulted into a significant amount of um, you know, em emissions of carbon dioxide, which we, the developing part of the world, we did not really contribute to, but we are experiencing all, you know, we are only experiencing the impacts, however, due to the different uh, capacities, you know, the developing countries actually are the ones that are being hit the most. Now, to your question, um, you know, uh, when you look at the different um, COPs, I'm sure you've heard of COP, which is the, 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 the climate, uh, it's the COP of, what, what is it again? <laughs> conference of Parties, which is basically a, a climate change conference that is organized every year to discuss the issues at hand. And oftentimes, um, you know, we'll, the topic around the 100 billion, so there's a, a, a figure, 100 billion dollars that have been, quote unquote, uh, sort of, com not commi well, committed uh, by the developed countries that this money will be flowing on an annual basis, but that, doesn't, that hasn't happened. However, um, I would like to now bring back the conversation to Rwanda, because I think one of the things that we see is we can't always also be out there complaining. It's, it's actually how do we position ourselves to be able to even tap into that small piece of cake that is available. So which I think the government of Rwanda has done very well. Um, one, uh, we, it's an obligation. So climate change is, is, is impacting all of us. So therefore, uh, as you know, under the UN and uh, under the Paris Agreement, it's an obligation for the countries to all come together um, to agree on how to tackle this problem that affects everybody. So just to say, uh, the government of Rwanda was the first African country to review its NDC. So the NDC is pretty much uh, the climate action plan. So in 2020, uh, very ambitious, we made an, an ambitious target and said, we are going to, uh, one, we're going to develop, but in a sustainable manner. And I think it's also important to highlight this. We don't need to choose between what, you know, we don't need to choose between development and addressing climate change, but rather how do we you know, develop in a climate compatible way since we know that if we ignore it, it's also going to impact us. So I think, um, so from that, we made a, an ambitious target to reduce carbon emissions by 38% by the year 2030. And we did uh, further, so with the, you know, under the Ministry of Environment and REMA studies were done to even estimate 
we want to make sure that we also understand what is going to be the cost uh, for us to actually achieve this target, which um, Juliet alluded to earlier. And there's this target to basically, we, in order for us to uh, achieve this target of reducing carbon emissions by 38% by 2030 is 11 billion. Now, we've done further studies to say where are we? And right now, we're looking at a gap of 6.5 billion. So just wanted to provide that, uh, that background. Now, the other point I want to highlight is, again, why, why does it matter? Now, coming to Rwanda, why does it really matter for us to, 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 to take this issue of climate change serious? Uh, when you look at so several studies, and uh, I think there was a study on the economics of climate change, and recently there's a World Bank, uh, it's called the CCDR. Basically, it says that, you know, between, and I'm sure the number has increased, but, uh, as, you know, the last time I checked, 2.5% of our GDP uh, was lost on an annual basis. So currently, the GDP is around 13 billion. Now think about it, 2.5%, that's approximately 800 million a year. Now, that is quite significant for a country like Rwanda, where, I mean, also for any country, we have many different uh, uh, needs, you know, we need, as a country, we need to develop different sectors. So if we don't take this seriously and then keep losing this, you know, this is a huge figure for, for our economy. So really wanted to emphasize that. Now, that's where really the government prioritized addressing climate change, developing in a compatible manner, and that's where you see our policy. So we have uh, 2050. Uh, when you look at our, our vision 2050, we want to be a carbon neutral economy. We want to develop, but again, really taking this seriously. We have so many strategies, but even beyond that, now where I come to introduce the fund, um, the government, I, th I think uh, my colleagues here, you talked about it. We can do all this talk. We can say it's important and we can talk about the impacts. But at the end of the day, if we don't have the resources, fi the financial resources to address the issues, then it doesn't really make sense. And I think that's where, again, the government of Rwanda has done an amazing job to say, you know what, we'll establish a fund, a financing vehicle, which can really play the role of resource mobilization. So that's what we do at the Rwanda Green Fund. We work with um, uh, partners, bilateral partners, as well as multilateral, and we're busy mobilizing financing. Of course, when you look at the needs and what we're mobilizing, yes, there's still a big gap, but we also have a role to catalyze. So we recently we worked with the Development Bank of Rwanda. So we're going out there, working with our Ministry of Finance, working with the financial sector and saying, guys, look, uh, we, there's, first of all, there's also money out there. How do we unlock it? How do we mobilize the funding? Um, so uh, at the fund, over the last, it's been what? The fund was established in 20, 2012, so close to, now it's 12 years. We've been able to mobilize uh, up to $300 million. And the way we would work is we, we mobilize funds through a basket fund, and we issue calls for applications. I hope you've seen some of these. We've, you know, we constantly, whenever the money is in the basket, we put out calls for applications, and we've been able to invest in both public, mainly public sector, but recently we're really, uh, I think as of last year, we're being very aggressive in terms of how do we also, uh, you know, get to support the private sector. So just to name, um, the, the, the sect when you look at the sectors that, um, that, that, that the government or looking at the NDC or the, even the fund level, these are not new sectors, they're really priority sectors. So when we invest in projects, we're looking at um, you know, agriculture. We know that 70% uh, of our population relies on agriculture, which is rain-fed ag agriculture. So it's still really uh, subsistence farming, which means this is actually where the biggest challenge is. If, if, if almost, you know, the entire 70% of our population relies on this sector that is highly impacted by climate change, we do need to place a focus on that. So we invest in projects uh, of agriculture. We've invested, I don't know if some of you have heard of Green Gichumbi. These are big projects. Uh, it's a big project that is being in, in, implemented in nine sectors of Gichumbi district where we're working with farmers, uh, you know, like tea farmers, uh, teaching them about the techniques. How do you, you know, sometimes you have too much rain. How do you capture that rain? Sometimes you don't have water. So, so it's really techniques. When it's too much, how do you store it? When it's not there, how do you, so it, it, how do you improve your, your infrastructure, drainage systems? Uh, but there's also another important element of our, you know, our population. Uh, so whatever we do is not just, yes, there's the climate change, but I think you mentioned it, you said, it's the livelihoods. And really when you look at the, the people that are mostly affected by climate change, it's the poorest. So the poorest people 
who are living in uh, you know high risk zones. I'm sure we all we all know, we all experience what happened. Uh, you know, last year in May, where 130 lives were lost. And and to be quite frank, the, that's where we also place an emphasis. It's like, where should we invest? Where we can see the most impact. So some you know in some of the the, the components, we make sure that. We're looking at the livelihoods that are vulnerable, that are living in areas of high risk zone. We relocate them, put uh, green village models where they can, one, again, we try to bring in the, the sustainability, water storage, using uh, technology such as solar, solar panels, um, but also livelihoods. They need to be, um, they need to be, we need to make sure that we're addressing the livelihoods. So whether it's uh, farming, but like making sure that these people, when tomorrow there's a shock, they'll be able to uh, sustain. Now, last but not least, so we've also invested in, you know, uh, the likes of, uh, well, Rema <laughs> developed a project. I hope you've all been to Nyantungo Eco Park. So, uh, you know, Rema looking really at uh, the wetlands, you know, sort of uh, overseeing uh, the, the, the wetlands, but we also try to say, how do, what's the, how do we make them productive? Yes, we're protecting them, so they submitted a proposal, and now we have Nyantungo Eco Park, and maybe Juliet can add more. There's more to come. But we, whatever we're doing is, yes, we're preserving the environment. We are building resilience against climate change. But it's also people at the center. At the end of the day, whatever we do has to, it's, it's for the people. Um, now, last but not least, um, I also wanted to, although we've been talking about the threat, I think there's also an opportunity. And, you know, maybe this sounds a bit <laughs> weird, but I... When you look around the globe and around the world right now, whether any investor, when everybody who's talking about deploying capital um, is really interested in sustainability. So um, I also do believe that uh, it's an opportunity, again, for Africa. It's how do we prepare ourselves or how do we make sure that we understand what these investors are looking for so that we can position ourselves to attract this green financing that is out there. Because really, in the years to come, it's when you look at different, uh, you know, even for us here right now, I know that the central bank has issued guidelines. So in a couple of years, banks will start disclosing. So really, it's the new, it's, it's no longer a, 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 an issue of the past. Climate change is happening. It's here. It's impacting our economy. And so how do we, how do we make sure that we are, we are ready to also tap into this uh, private, um, you know, the private capital that is out there, considering that we have, you know, we have KIFC, the Kigali International Financial Center, which really has positioned again to attract investors in the sustainable finance. So how, how do we uh, really uh, position ourselves? And maybe to conclude, back to the question you asked, I think the conversation of the countries from, you know, I, I, I'm not speaking on behalf of other countries, but I think what we should be doing is readiness. How do we prepare ourselves to attract this money rather than, I know we can complain forever. There's so many problems in the world and unfairness, right? But I don't think that should be, I think as Africans and as developed, we need to really equip ourselves. Like how, how are we prepared to access this money? Even though the money is not sufficient, um, how do we make sure that we attract the small piece of the cake? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Just a small point because, sorry, you're the money person on the panel. Um, carbon trading. There are a number of African countries that have gone down that path. Um, where is Rwanda at? Uh, I haven't checked, so I'm relying on your expertise. And also, is this really genuine and sincere or are we just letting off the polluters when we get into carbon trading? Thank you for, for the question. And I also think Juliet can come in. Um, I think first of all for Rwanda, uh, last, the last COP, we, we launched a carbon market framework because, so carbon market is just like any market, um, but there's also two ways in which it can, it can it, there's two different markets if I can call it. There's the regulated market or the voluntary market. So there's a market out there, private sector, you have a project you can go. Of course, it's, it's, it's really quite, quite something in order for you to get to a point where you're ready to trade. Uh, you know, verifiers and all of that. But at least on the side of Rwanda, we had to put in place a, a framework because, you know, some of, you know, it's, it's a market that needs to be regulated. Now, I do believe that, you know, the, the carbon market framework has, has had its ups and downs, you know, 
It's also one where, um, you know, a lot of, the, especially I think on the private sector side, people can, you know, there have been tendency of greenwashing where, you know, people might claim that they're implementing products that are green when they're not. So there's been a bit of backlash, but I also do believe that there's an opportunity as long as we do it well. Because right now, for example, on the side, uh, you know, of, 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 of Randa, we do have quite a number of investors who are interested. There's also through the bilateral, so the regulated, the regulated uh, uh, pathway, we have a number of countries that have expressed interest to buy credits from Rwanda. And what we're doing right now, again, is the readiness, because it, it is quite a, a um, it does require for expertise in terms of, you know, valuation. You know, how do you move a project? Basically, you start off with a project, be able to monetize it. So there's several processes which we don't shy away that it's, also an, it's new for us. And at the moment, we're really focusing on getting the expertise, the legal aspects, so that we can, uh, the, the plan is to have a transaction by the end of this year. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Finally, we come across to you, uh, Professor Beth. We, you spend a lot of time researching into how we manage our resources and, and, and biodiversity and so on. I wonder what you found as, as it affects uh, the climate crisis. Over to you. Thank you. Um, is this on? Yeah, it's on. Thank you. Um, I want to thank uh, everybody for listening to us here, for, for inviting me to talk to you. And I have to say it's a, an, a real honor, and actually I'm very excited to be linking national security to climate change and, in particular, biodiversity, which is my real passion. And we are here in a biodiversity hotspot here in Rwanda. It means it's one of the countries that has the most number of different species um, anywhere in the world, one of the highest places. And also what's interesting, for such a tiny country, um, we're still finding new species here, which is amazing, new to science. Either range extensions or completely new species. But what I, I really wanted to talk about was that connection between climate change and biodiversity and and in national security. And one of the things recently that's been in more discussion, um, maybe more in academic literature, but also in other venues, is the importance of linking climate change to biodiversity. So simply, biodiversity is all living things and their interactions. It's those interactions that give us services that we need. We talked about agriculture. We can't have agriculture without biodiversity, the pollinators and um, the, the natural predators of, of crop pests and things like that. So we are in this, this crisis time of climate change and biodiversity, and we are trying to get to resilience. And I like to talk about resilience, um, especially I work a lot with students. That's actually what gives me a lot of hope, is the young people. And um, before I end what I'm saying now, I wanted to get back to the young people and students. But um, in terms of resilience, I like to liken it to our bodies. And I think we all can agree if our body is not feeling healthy, if we haven't eaten well or haven't slept well or we are stressed, we are less able to be resilient, meaning we may get sick, but it may last a very long time before we get well again. And resilience comes about when you have a, a healthy system, your body is able to recover more quickly. And that's what we need of our ecosystems, that what we need in, in every country, every location we have is the resilience to climate change. So when the cyclones are entering, when these um, floods are happening, how do we build these systems that are more resilient, that can recover more quickly and lose less, um, be, be less harmed? I think that's one of the big challenges we're facing now. And um, part of that is through um, valuing more our biodiversity. And I think I can say Rwanda has done a tremendous job of um, really valorizing the biodiversity and trying to restore ecosystems. Like you mentioned, Yandungu Eco Park, that was a, a wetland that had been um, very much turned into a different kind of system and then returning it back to a healthy functioning wetland, which provides many different services that can help us be resilient and more prepared for these climate crises and disasters. 
And um, another thing I wanted to mention is that many African countries are very reliant on the biodiversity, on nature-based um, tourism. And that can also be a link to, to economic crises because when, um, like we know during the pandemic when tourism dropped, that had a big impact on uh, major national economies. Um, also, uh, climate change uh, can have an impact not only on ecotourism but also on human health issues. Um, so that also puts a major stress not only on human populations but also the services that governments provide like our health care system, our clinics. So this really strains economies. Um, so again, as many economies rely on healthy functioning ecosystems, what we try to do is get to these more resilient ecosystems, and I'm, then I'm bringing it back to biodiversity, making sure that we have these systems that have the complement of species that are contributing services that keep the resilience of those systems against climate change impacts, these shocks to the system. And some of the solutions, I think, I, I think you mentioned, some of you mentioned that it's important to be to, to be positive about this because um, sometimes it can be very scary or depressing when we look at these dual um, crises we're facing, these, these climate shocks. We're losing species at an unprecedented rate. Um, but I'm a perennially positive person and I believe there's many opportunities for us. Um, and I think the military can actually be um, a model for what is positive. And one of the approaches, for example, is taking, excuse me, <coughs> taking a nature um, positive approach. So in all the functions and the systems that are happening, whether it's in a military, whether it's in the education system, um, the finance system, um, whatever system you're talking about, being nature positive um, about the business you're doing means that you're taking into account the activities you're doing that are not having a negative impact on the environment or causing resilience of systems to be reduced, so more vulnerable to climate change. And the other thing I wanted to mention is the, the amazing opportunities for innovation. This is also something you were talking about, Teddy, is um, there's a lot of financing out there, and I think that countries really need to be ready this is also where our young population is very, very important. Um, and I, I have devoted my career really to, in academia, to working with young people. I think it really keeps one young as well, or tries to. Um, but I think that the youth really are going to have a tremendous role to play here. Um, coming up with innovations for how we are going to deal with these climate shocks, how we are going to get better at um, building resilient systems in all of the businesses that we do, again, whether it is the military or education or food production, um, it can be looked at as a cost, but it can also be looked at as an opportunity and accessing the finance that is out there. So again, it gets back to readiness. Um, and uh, I just want to end on... Um, one thing back to the military is um, that there's a lot of technologies that are out there. Um, we as scientists, we want access to drones. It's very difficult to use drones to get good data in many um, different systems. And I think there can be more, there's an opportunity for more collaboration with the military. The military also has a lot of land that um, in many countries, military actually are the ones protecting a lot of endangered um, species and ecosystems. So I think there's really a lot of doors to be opened and more collaboration in that area. And um, yeah, that's what I wanted to end it on. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Just one easy question for you, Prof. Okay. Um, how hopeful are you that we can save the, the world? How hopeful? Yeah. Are, are we that we can save? Uh, <laughs> So what I can say is it's not possible for me to, um, to think other than that we can do it. Um, I, I think it's just in my personality. I couldn't wake up in the morning and think, oh, another day and we're doomed. I wake up thinking, it's another day, what can we do? And I think we have to, that's the only course. Um, we have to, it, we are in dire straits, um, but I think the human mind is capable of amazing things. 
we have done a lot of really bad things, but we have also done a lot of really amazing things. And I think we need to focus on the amazing things that we are capable of doing to solve this problem. And if these countries and communities and elders and youth can come together, we can come up with these kind of solutions. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much indeed.